Genesis 16, we're going to look at verses 1 through 16 here tonight in our study. Now tonight we're going to look at this, one of the greatest mistakes in Abram's life. A mistake that has really, we're still reaping the consequences of this mistake even to this day. And I'll explain that in a moment. But his mistake was trying to help God out, basically. Trying to help God out and fulfill the promise of this child that God said he was going to give to Abram and his wife. Now the problem basically was Abram was listening to his wife and listening to her counsel and not trusting the Lord. And so this is an issue that I think all of us have difficulty with, listening to the wrong voices in counsel, not taking that counsel and taking it to the Lord and praying about it, asking God before we just step out and start acting on some counsel that has been given to us. And many times just not trusting the Lord for what he has promised to do, not waiting upon him for what he wants to do. And so let's just read this beginning of this story here, verse 1 of chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. There it is. Verse 3. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. After Abram had dealt, dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So after ten years of waiting for the, this promised child, all of a sudden Sarai has a, an idea. She has a good idea. Well, I can't have children, so maybe you should marry Hagar and she can give you children. Now, notice that it says here in verse 3 that he took her as his wife. One of the problems I had with that mini-series that was on not too long ago on the Bible was that, well, that one of the first programs I watched, I mean, it looked like Abram just committed adultery with Hagar. But the scripture says that he took her as his wife. Very important little phrase. And so this was a legal marriage. This was a very common thing in that day and age. And so when a woman could not bear children and could not give uh, her husband an heir, then many times this was a very common practice where they would take a second wife from outside of the home or from one of their maidservants. And then this would provide an heir. Now this is what is called in the scripture the times of ignorance. If you say to yourself, well, here's a man of faith, what, what is he doing? Well, he obviously is not doing the right thing here, but the Bible calls this a time of ignorance. In Acts 17, 30, there, Paul said, truly, these times of ignorance, or literally, times of lack of knowledge, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And so this whole period before Christ's coming is called a time of ignorance, very important. And so when you look at these stories or you look at David taking several wives, you just say to yourself, 
what, what is up here? Why are they doing these things? Times of ignorance. And so this was a common practice. Now what takes place here is what I call the plan of the flesh. Okay, It's a plan that is devised by humans, by a human being, to try and help God out, to try and take care of the promise that God has made to this man. Now, common sense or common reasoning sometimes seems really good. It's a good idea. It's a great idea. God promised me a child. You're not giving me a child, so he, it must mean that I'm going to have a child through someone else. And yet, that was not the plan at all. That was the furthest thing from God's plan. Clearly, because we can see that because we get to read the rest of the story. You see, we, we can all go, well, that's just really foolish. But I wonder how many of us would have thought up the same plan if we lived in his day. I'll bet you many of us. And so don't be too quick to judge this guy or her. But human reasoning sounds so good, and yet sometimes it is the most, it's diametrically opposed to God's plan and his will, his purpose, and what he wants to accomplish. You see, God has a perfect timing, and he has a perfect way of fulfilling his timing in your life and fulfilling his purposes in your life. Now, my associate, Pastor Bill, he always says, right time, right person, and right, right place. It's, so it's, you know, that is just such wisdom because that's such a biblical concept. When God is doing something, there is the right person at the right place at the right time. God seems to put those things together. I mean, just last night when we were out at the pier sharing the gospel, the people that we shared with, it was so obvious that this was a divine appointment for us to talk to these people. I mean, one couple they were moving from San Francisco to Santa Barbara and they were spending one night in Pismo Beach. One night. And two of us talked to the same couple. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm thinking to myself. I mean, they, we walked up to them and they started laughing. They said, boy, I mean, God must have it in for us, you know, tonight. And yeah, he does. He definitely had it in for you. He has your number. And so, you know, basically this, this is an issue that is so clear in the scripture. Let me show you this. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, referring to Jesus Christ. So in the fullness of time, there was a very specific time in history, in the history of the nation Israel, in the history of the world, that Christ was to come. It was a very specific time, predicted hundreds of years before, and that the fulfillment of Christ coming into Jerusalem was on the very day he predicted. In Genesis 17:21. God speaks to Sarah. It says, or excuse me, to Abram. And he says, But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. This set time. And then Genesis 21 2. And Sarah conceived and bore Abram a, Abraham a son and his, in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. So notice that the scripture makes it very clear. It's a set time. God has a set time, a plan that he is fulfilling. And that is true for every single one of us in this room. Every one of us, we have 
God at work in our lives and there is a set time for when and how he is going to fulfill that plan in his time and I don't want to try and help him out with that he is very able to work it out all by himself he doesn't need my help so many times people ask well why did God wait so long I mean he makes Abram, Abraham wait 25 years for this promised child. Why does he wait so long? Well, you know, the Bible tells us why he made him wait so long. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12. It says, therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. From one man, as good as dead. What does that mean? We see at this particular point in time, Abram, what is, he's still able to bear children. Because what happens? He goes in, he marries Hagar, he goes into her, and she has a child. So this guy at 85 years old was still a virile man. Now, Sarah was barren, but for God to accomplish his purpose, Abraham had to see, I'm dead. I cannot bear children anymore. And Sarah had to see herself as dead, as not able to fulfill this. And so many times that is the reason why God waits. He waits so that person will realize and see that they can't fulfill it. I can't do this. So when you come to those places where you say, I can't do this, I don't know how I'm going to do this, that really is a very good place to be. Because there, and only there, is when you will trust the Lord. You will say, okay God, you're the only one who can do that. God says, that's just what I was waiting for. I was waiting for you to acknowledge I'm the only one who can do it. Because then God gets the glory. And he is revealed as the God who sees, as we will see in just a moment. So waiting on God to fulfill his promise was Abraham and Sarah's greatest test. This is, I believe, every one of our greatest test. You see, faith, the scripture reveals that faith gives you instant access at times to God's provision, his plan, his, his grace. And other times, faith is that which requires you to wait. You see, faith that, well, what is seen, you don't need faith for, right? What is seen, you don't need hope for. So that is a clear instruction from Scripture. So sometimes faith is required for you to wait and to wait to see the Lord actually do what he has promised to do. And so faith requires this. I mean, when you look at the stories of Joseph in prison, he spends... 20 years in exile before he sees the fulfilling of the, the visions and the, the promises that God has made to him. David, he spends probably a good 13 to 20 years, depending on which commentary you read. But 13 to 20, whatever, it's a long time. You're, you're running from Saul from hideout to hideout, and you're wondering, when is the Lord going to fulfill his promise? And so, these are two great heroes of the Bible. And they had to wait. God promised, but they had to wait. So the question is, what are you waiting for? Are, is God asking you to wait for something that he has promised to you? That he's talked to you about? If it is, if you, you will either submit to him over that issue or you will fight him over that issue. Abraham and Sarah were fighting 
with the Lord over this issue. And, well, probably Sarah more so, because she's the one that came up with the plan. She clearly, as you read this, she's upset. She's angry. And she is really most likely blaming the Lord because she said here in verse 2, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. So she's really saying, Lord, this is your fault. You, you promised, but you're not doing it. So have you, ever, have you ever gotten angry like that with the Lord? Have you ever said, Lord, you promised. What's your deal? What's, what's up here? Why isn't this taking place? I can't answer all of those questions, but he can. And he will if you wait upon him for his direction. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, notice there that it says, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. In other words, if you believe, you're, you're not going to try and work it out yourself. You're going to wait. It requires waiting. In Psalm 27, 14, it says, Wait on the Lord, and He shall strengthen your heart. And that's what you need to do. You need to wait upon the Lord. And he will strengthen your heart. He will guide you and direct you. Now the question here that I raised earlier is, who do you get your counsel from and what do you do when you get that counsel? Those are two very important questions. Who do you get your counsel from? And then what do you do with that counsel after you get it? So choosing who you get counsel from is really an important thing. If you go to someone that is biblically illiterate and or you ask someone that is very new in their faith and they give you wrong counsel and you just act on that, you're in trouble. If somebody gives you good counsel but it doesn't apply to you and you just go out and act on it, you're going you're gonna to have trouble. So the issue is is first determine who you're going to get counsel from and does that counsel really come from the word of god every book that you buy and that you read the first thing you should do before you buy it is page through it and just see how much scripture is in it how many scriptural references are in that book because if you don't see a lot i would recommend you not buying it because what you're buying is somebody's ideas that are not most likely based in scripture. Secondly, I would encourage you, once you get that counsel, if it's good counsel, that it's based biblically, that you then take it to prayer and ask the Lord to confirm that as for you. I usually send people out of my office with, take this and pray about it, and ask the Lord to direct your path. Take what I've shared. I usually even end my, the counseling session with prayer like that. Lord, take what is of you and apply it in this heart. And what is not of you, reveal that. So it is an essential thing. You remember when Jethro came to Moses in the wilderness and told Moses, Moses, you're going to wear out. You, you need to get a bunch of men to help you take care of all of the needs of the people of Israel. Because you can't take care of everybody's little problems. You need to get people to take care of minor issues, issues that they can't handle, then bring them to you. And if you can't make a decision, you then come to me and I will answer you. And Moses heard this counsel and you know how Jethro ended it? He said this to him in Exodus 18.23. He said, if you do this thing, and God so commands you. He says, it's not Jethro commanding you. If God so commands you. He said, then you will be able to endure, and all this people will also go to their place in peace. And so, a very important thing. 
You see, the reason why you need to go to God and wait upon Him and ask for that confirmation is because you really need to cultivate an ear to hear the voice of the Lord. Do you do that? And are you doing that? Do you wait upon Him and do you ask God to speak to you? Now, if you want to tune your ear to hear His voice, read His Word because that's what's going to tune you to His frequency so you will know His voice because He will never speak to you something that's contrary to His Word. But you need to hear His voice. You're a Christian tonight because why? Jesus said this in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So you need to hear His voice. You already have heard His voice. That's why you're a believer tonight. So I know you have heard His voice. You should be assured that you've heard His voice. But are you cultivating hearing His voice? Because that is critical. It's critical for your Christian life. So when do you ask the Lord for His persuasion, His confirmation? over whatever counsel you, you have and you get. Very important. Now, verses 4 through 6, notice the results of the plan of the flesh. So, he, referring to Abraham, he went in to Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. So Hagar really, she just despised Sarai here. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand, do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. So the whole thing blows up in, their, in both their faces here. I mean, there is instantaneous conflict in this household over this whole issue, which is a very interesting result. Hagar despises Sarai. Sarai blames God and blames Abram. And she says, my fault, it's on you, buddy. And so she just dumps it in his lap. And what does he do? He dumps it right back in her lap. And he says, do with her whatever you want. I, I'm out of here. And Abram wimps out here big time. You see, he doesn't take any spiritual leadership here at all. He doesn't take responsibility as the head of his own home. And he dumps it back on her. And what does she do? She takes it out on Hagar. And so it's, it's all around a mess. Anger, despising, blame shifting. Those are all the result of, well, your plans gone awry. It's always the result. You see, when, it, when, when nothing goes as you have worked it out and planned that it's going to do, then all of a sudden you say, well, it's got to be their fault. It's got to it's be that pastor. It's got to be his problem. Or it's got to be my husband. Or it's got to be my wife. Or it's got to be that friend that I talk to. It's got to be somebody's problem. And it can't be mine. We don't like to take responsibility for our own failures. And that's what is, you see here. This is the result of the plan and the schemes of the flesh. When it doesn't go well, it's, it, I don't, I don't want to hear it. I, I didn't do anything. I, didn't take, I don't want to take responsibility. And yet in Proverbs 15:12. It says this, a scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. Now that is a very interesting piece of wisdom because a scoffer never will love. 
does not love somebody that corrects him because he doesn't want to be corrected. He doesn't want to see his fault. And yet, seeing your fault in a matter is really an incredibly maturing aspect to your life and your Christian walk. You have to see your fault. And everybody in this room, we all have plenty of fault. There's no question about that in my mind. I'll tell you, I, I see enough of my faults every day to overflow the cup. And I hope you do as well. And I hope you admit them. And I hope you acknowledge them. Do you acknowledge your fault? And do you do it easily? When somebody confronts you, do you immediately take the defensive and just try and point the finger right back at them? Or do you say, okay, all right, what did I do here? What is my issue here? Because that's what maturity is. In Matthew 7, 5, what does Jesus say? He said, first take the plank out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So you gotta, you got to first look at your own plank, your own fault. And neither Abram or Sarai do that in this story. They don't do it. It's, it's your fault. And it's your responsibility, and it's in your lap. In Psalm 32, 5, David said, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I acknowledged my sin to you. Really an important thing. And so do you do that? Do you do that regularly? Do you do that honestly before God? It's, it is such a critical issue. In Proverbs 19.3, it says this, The foolishness of man twists his way, or literally perverts his way, and his heart frets against the Lord. So my own foolishness perverts my own way, I make bad choices, and then I get angry at God because I made those bad choices. You see, there's something wrong with that. And it's backwards. And so what should have Abram done here in this circumstance? He should have done what he did when he had that tremendous failure in Egypt. Remember a few chapters back? when he went down to Egypt and he lied to the Pharaoh about his, his wife and that she was his sister, and it just brought incredible reproach upon him. What did Abram do when he came back into the land? He built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. That's exactly what Abram should have done here. He should have said, oh boy, this is a mess and I'm a part of it and you know what we need to go build an altar and call upon the name of the Lord and acknowledge our fault ask his forgiveness and ask him what to do instead of dropping the hammer on each other and then dropping the hammer on Hagar so that's what he should have done but he doesn't do it and so the results of this conflict we still have today. Do you realize this? this? This conflict between Ishmael and the promised child, Isaac, still goes on today. You see, Ishmael is the father of the Arab peoples, and Isaac is the father of the Jewish people. And so we have this Arab-Israeli conflict, we call it. And that conflict is going on to, to this day. And it will be the cause of the great battle that is described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. The Arab nations coming against the nation of Israel. And that battle is still yet future. It's coming. And it's the result of this plan of the flesh. Now, let me back up for a minute. Do you know why I call this a plan of the flesh? Because 
the Apostle Paul uses this mistake, this error, this sin of Abram and Sarai as an illustration of the works of the flesh versus faith. Let me read it to you. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 23, it says, But he, referring to Ishmael, who was born of the bondwoman, was born according to the flesh. And he, referring to Isaac, of the free woman through promise. And so he declares that this is a, a, an allegory that is taken from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And Paul says, this is an example of people trying to save themselves, trying to work up the, their own salvation, the fulfillment of God's promises versus someone just trusting God for what he has said. And so it's a, an incredible example and illustration to all of us. So don't do it. Now last year in verses 7 through 16 is God's intervention into this whole mess. Very interesting. Notice what he does. Verse 7. Now the angel of the Lord found her, referring to Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur, which is somewhere in the Sinai. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from? And where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted from multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. And he will be a wild man. Or literally, this is a wild donkey. That's literally what the Hebrew declares here. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called on the name of Jehovah, or the Lord, who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, I, also, I ha Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy, Observe, it is between Kadesh and Barat. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So what, what takes place here? Note that the Lord goes after Hagar. Very interesting here. This man of faith, a woman of faith, not making some good decisions here, really stumbling in their life. So who goes after her? The God who sees. The God who sees it all, who knows it all, has heard it all, watched it all. He goes after her. Now, this reveals, I think, one of the most powerful things about the Lord is that he cares. He cares about people who have gotten the raunchy deal from somebody else's scheme that has nothing to do with him. He could just say, hey, I didn't do this. This is your problem. You handle it. But he doesn't do that. He jumps right in the middle of this. And he says, where are you going? What are you doing? And he gives... Hagar, this incredible counsel here. So he cares about people who get jacked up over somebody else's schemes, okay? And that's a powerful truth. Think about it. God cares. He loves. 
He cares so much that he sent this angel of the Lord. We'll talk about who this is in just a moment. But he sends the angel of the Lord to this slave girl, this maidservant. You'd say, she's nobody, but he cares. That's powerful. You know, the scripture declares in Luke 19.10, it says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, I was nobody. You're nobody. But he sought you out. And he came to you. And he spoke to you. Why? Because he sees you. Just like he saw this slave girl out in the middle of the wilderness at a well someplace, some spring. She's just getting a drink of water. And he comes to her. Powerful. So, where did the Lord see you? And where did he come and meet you? Well, for all of us, that's a different, a different story. But it's a real thing. That's the reason why you're here tonight, is because the Lord sought you out to reach you, to touch you and your life. It's powerful. So remember that. Never forget it. He's the one that's seeking you and will counsel you even if you're a part of somebody else's scheme. You agreed to the scheme. You were a part of it. He still will speak to you, counsel you, direct you and restore you and that's exactly what takes place here and he she is restored to the Lord and so God sees do you believe that do you believe that God sees you and knows exactly what's going on in your life today he does he knows exactly what's happening and you say well if he does then how come he isn't doing what I've been asking him to do well that brings us back to the first point we talked about is because yeah, this is a test of your faith. When God waits, it is for a very good reason. He's waiting to obtain something in your life. And whatever that is, the Lord will speak to you. But that means you have to have an ear to hear his voice. So what is he trying to say to you? In Proverbs 15:3. It says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. You know, this particular phrase is used many times in the Old and New Testament. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the entire earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are loyal toward him. That's what the scripture promises. So he wants, to, he wants to get my heart in the right place and then he will show himself strong in my behalf. He longs to do that. So who is this angel of the Lord? Now this is probably one of the great issues uh, in the scripture that people question well, who is this angel of the Lord? I believe this is a theophany. It's God coming in flesh before the incarnation of Christ. Now, the reason why I believe that is because note what this angel of the Lord says. He says he's going to do something for her that only God can do. So he's making promises to her as if he is the Lord. Then she turns around in verse 13 and she calls him the Lord. She says, then it says she called the name of Jehovah who spoke to her. You see, Jehovah spoke to her. The, the Lord of heaven and earth came. Now the word angel here you have to understand that this word can be translated messenger. And so the messenger of Jehovah 
is the Son of God before his incarnation. And so you will see this many places in the Old Testament. We will come to another circumstance later on in Abraham's life. There are several of them in the Old Testament. But this is the first place in the scripture, this time where it, wherever it, this phrase is used, the angel of the Lord. So this first occurrence is very important. And it identifies this angel of the Lord as the same angel of the Lord that was in the burning bush that spoke to Moses that said, I am that I am. So it's pretty clear this angel of the Lord is not some created being as the Jehovah Witnesses declare, but he is the Lord of heaven. Notice she also said, she calls him God. She says, you are the God who sees. So she calls him the Lord and she calls him God. So that's pretty clear. Later on, you'll see in the scripture, the angel of the Lord is worshiped by people and he does not deny them. Wherever an angel is worshiped, a true angel, a created being is worshiped in scripture. They always deny the worship. They tell the person worshiping that they should get up because they don't deserve worship. So this angel of the Lord, he receives worship wherever he is seen in the scripture. And so the messenger of Jehovah promises to do only what God can do. She calls him this God who sees. Now, Satan wants you to think that when you fail, when you blow it, when you're involved in somebody else's scheme that blows up in your face, or you were the schemer, he wants you to think you're done. You're done. Give it up. God's done with you. But that's the furthest thing from the case. This story proves that. This story proves that God will go after Hagar and he will even continue to work with Abram and Sarai because God's not finished with them either. He's not happy with their plan here and he will tell them so. Their, their idea was not his idea. God will make that very clear to Abraham. But notice that he doesn't give up on any one of them. He pursues them. He goes after them. Now, I believe that is important because God will speak. He will continue to instruct. He will guide you. If you will build your altar, so to speak, acknowledge your fault, ask his forgiveness, ask his direction, he will guide your path because that's what it's all about. It says in Psalm 32, verses 8 and 9, God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and a bridle, else they will not come near you. So the Lord is saying, I will instruct you. I will guide you. I will instruct you what, in whatever your, your need is. Just don't be like a horse or a mule and that needs a bit in its mouth. Don't be rebellious. Don't be stubborn. Listen to his voice. Cultivate hearing the voice of the Lord as I was sharing with you earlier. That is an essential part of your, your growth. And does, does Hagar listen to the angel of the Lord here? Yes, she does. She does what he tells her to do, which is to go home and to submit herself to Sarai. Now, this is only because her harshness was verbal, not physical. If there is ever physical abuse in someone's 
marital relationship or friendship relationship, you should cut that relationship off because that is not a good situation and it will only get worse. So don't misapply this particular text and what is the counsel that is given here. She was verbally harsh with Hagar and there was no physical abuse. So very important. So what is the command? She says, return. The angel of the Lord says, return and submit yourself. She does it. Then he gives her a promise. Notice. He said in verse 10, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted from multitude. So he promises her that this child that she's going to bear, that it is going to... The, it's going to be an innumerable group of people that will come forth from her. Nations shall come from her. And as I said earlier, the Arab peoples all come from Ishmael. And then, secondly, he says, you shall bear a son and call his name Ishmael. And so, uh, literally here this in this particular text, verse 11, it says, God hears. That's what Ishmael means. God hears, and he heard her. So he promises to bless her, shows her that she's going to have a son. But then this little statement here, verse 12, he shall be a wild donkey or a wild ass of a man, if you read the old King James Version. So what does this mean? Well, it means his hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. In other words, He's going to be a very volatile individual. Notice that God knows that before he's even born. Very important. In fact, you can see aggressive children as they grow. And if you're a parent, you need to deal with that because aggressive children become aggressive adults. And so you need to address that when you see that in a child growing up. And he says, every man's hand will be against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. If you go to Genesis 25, 18, it says that when Ishmael dies, he dies in the presence of his brethren. So in other words, there's going to be tremendous conflict with this man. He's going to be a very volatile individual. In fact, uh, Arab peoples are very volatile. I mean, if you look at the history of Arab nations, they kill each other more than they kill anyone, okay? Which is going on even at the present time in Syria today. And so there are numerous sects of Islam, and they kill each other on a regular basis. Whoever is in power, they use their power in that manner. So it's a, it's a very interesting prophecy here that is spoken by God about this individual man because he is a man that is going to be volatile and all that come from him are going to be volatile individuals. And so this conflict is something that she is told to understand, to look for, and so that's why I say to you parents, if you see children that you have that are aggressive, you should deal with that as quickly as you possibly can. And so God here had a message for Hagar. She heard the message and she obeyed the message. Now that is something that Abram and Sarai did not do in this chapter. Will they do it? Yes, they will. They will come to that place of growth in their faith and they will respond to him and they will trust him. But it is a process that they are going through and that process sometimes is not, it's not pretty. It's not easy. And it's not easy for you going through the process of learning to trust him and to hear from him. And so I just encourage you, cultivate that heart to hear his voice. Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. 
Father, we thank you tonight that, Lord, you are a God who sees. And Lord, I pray for any here tonight that, that don't believe that you see, that are angry with you, blaming you. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would convince them that you care, that you see it all. And Lord, you're, you're waiting for their heart to be in the right place or sometimes other people's hearts to be in the right place for you to fulfill the promise whatever that promise might be Lord I ask that tonight you would just assure each heart here that you see you care and Lord I pray that you would speak speak to each heart as we wait upon you right now Lord, we, we just open our hearts to you. Help us to hear your voice. Speak to your children. And Father, we will obey you. We will do whatever you command us to do. And Lord, we know you give us the grace to handle whatever you command. And so Lord, assure our hearts of that truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.